made it 73 million pet dogs in the United States. And something may be hunting them. A mutant canine reported across the country, but primarily in Maine and Minnesota. The head wasn't dog-like, it was cat-like. Um, it had a really horrible smell. 20 years of long nose, big teeth, and like hair coming out of his nose. It looked uh, more wolfish or possibly husky, malamute, something. And the worst thing that got me going is that, that the shape of this sucker. Big as a collie, maybe even bigger. And he had long black and gray hair. Most modern eyewitnesses describe a canine-like beast, about 120 pounds with a flat snout, broad hunched shoulders, short mangled ears, and a bushy tail. A description not unlike a beast reported centuries earlier. I've got reports uh, from Native Americans, from folklore, from colonial times, back two, three hundred years. Lauren Coleman is one of the world's leading cryptozoologists with almost 50 years experience in the field author of Mysterious America. Coleman is very familiar with the mutant beast stories. You have these reports of, of rather large wolf-like animals, almost like they're prehistoric dire wolf kind of creatures. About the same weight as the modern gray wolf, the dire wolf had a much larger broad head with massive teeth for crushing bone. Its legs were also shorter, supporting a thicker, more sturdy body. Experts say the dire died out 10,000 years ago, but modern eyewitnesses report a similar creature. August 12, 2006, Turner, Maine, located 50 miles from Portland, Maine. Michelle O'Donnell was with her dog, Bucko. One afternoon, I was sitting at my dining room table and my dog was going off. I looked out and saw an animal run across my yard and stop at a banking up on the far side of my driveway. I ran out the door and I got probably 10, 15 feet away from it and we just locked eyes and I went to take a step closer and it bolted off and my husband saw it run off through the back part of the yard and we'd never seen anything like that before in our lives. O'Donnell described the beast as wild-looking, but not a wolf. It had large jaws and huge eyes. It was also much larger than any dog she had seen before. Confused by what she observed, Come on. Michelle began to research animals on the internet, but could not find anything that matched what she saw. However, only a few days later, after receiving a tip from a neighbor, she discovered the creature's body only two blocks from her home. When I walked up to the animal and I looked down, I knew it was exactly what I saw the week before. There was no doubt in my mind. This is the area where we found the animal and I came to take pictures. It came to lay to rest right here. It was probably about this wide, full length of the body, maybe about a yard, yard and a half. These are the pictures. The heavy body and large jaws look like a dire wolf, but not the flat nose, bug-like eyes, and locked ears. A few days later, she decided to send the photos to a local newspaper where reporter Mark Laflamme of the Lewiston Sun Journal got his first look at the so-called Turner Beast. She sent me an email, asked me if I was interested in seeing photos of the animal. And I, I went out there and she had several high quality photos. I looked them over and nothing I could identify. It was a strange looking creature to be sure. Take a couple bait pails down with us. For Laflamme and many other local residents, the bigger question is, are there more of these mutant canines out there? 
In an effort to find out, La Flamme has enlisted the support of local animal control officer, Wendell Strout. Right there. Go over there and see if we can, that, that tree is big enough to strap the camera on, and then we'll put the bait over there on the pile. Together, they will deploy a number of motion-activated game cameras. Make, this, make sure this is all powered up right. I'm going to put it in test mode. We'll go to, what did we put on the other ones, Mark? Three? Yeah, that's good. They will also set baited live game traps in and around the area where the mutant carcass was found. Let's put the bait in here, Mark. Oh, yeah, it looks good, too, but that's, uh, looks nice. Can you do this in? Yeah, this goes right in here. That's it, and it's all set. You can leave it. The old is probably good. It's getting warmer out. So, yeah, it'll probably attract something. Well, I think there's a lot of people who, who really feel that there's something exotic or mysterious out there, and, you know, the, the turn of beast aside, there's something, if there's something still roaming out there, I think it's, you know, in everybody's best interest to find it, find out whatever it is, and learn as much as we can about it. Michelle O'Donnell's photos are not the only evidence of a mutant canine. The Shunka Waranki is a creature that we know from Montana. This photo is the only proof of the Shunkawarakeen. This Iowa Amerindian name means to carry off dogs. In the 1880s, a Montana ranger claimed he killed the strange animal, had it stuffed and displayed. This picture appeared in a book in 1977, the only evidence of the claim since the stuffed specimen had disappeared. It was very much like the, the main mystery creature, having large haunches, wolf-like uh, scruffy fur, uh, and it doesn't quite look like a wolf. Neither did the creature sighted in Rolod, Minnesota, located about 220 miles from Minneapolis. An eyewitness says a mutant canine is terrorizing his farm and killed his pet dog. A little over six years ago, the neighbor went into a nursing home and uh, I told him I'd take care of his, his Jack Russell Terrier. My neighbor Palmer had named him Fifi and I didn't think that was quite manly enough, so I just called him Fief. Wendell Olson has been a farmer all his life. It's a peaceful living, except for one night in September of 2006. Mm. And I put him out uh, one night, and he just uh, disappeared. I grabbed the flashlight and went around looking everywhere for it. And uh, I suppose it was about 10 minutes after it disappeared, uh, just to the south of the house here, I heard some uh, kind of a yelpish uh, scream and then some gasping. You know, I've never quite heard anything like it. Uh, it was kind of a breathy type of scream. And then it, it would just went quiet. So I assume that's, it was dying, you know. Something was biting it or choking it in some way. He never did find the hey, body. Thief! Hey, boy! Here, boy! Hey, thief! Where are you? Here, boy! Searched everywhere for a week. Uh, the first three days, I hardly got any sleep looking for the dog. I called everybody, called the Humane Society, tried to cover all the bases, and uh, walked through the woods with my other dog, and I could not find a, a hair or any sign of the dog. You know, I kind of feel that I failed on my promise to Palmer to take care of his dog when he had to die that way. So I, I, I do not feel good about it at all. The mystery on Wendell's farm deepens. About one month after Fief went missing, another attack occurred. This time, the victim was much larger. Wendell Olson's dog, Fief, is gone. 
fallen victim to an unknown predator. And I put him out uh, one night and he just uh, disappeared. One month later, Olson's farm is hit again. This time, the victim is a 700-pound colt, one of the animals Fief had been protecting. I have stallions up in the yard, and I had just moved the mares to a closer pasture. But there was an awful lot of whinnying all night long. Uh, but I thought, well, it's just because the mares are closer. But I, I went out in the morning, and uh, the horses were all standing on the opposite end of the pasture, and the little one was missing. And I looked over there at the other opposite edge towards the woods, and there it was laying there. And I figured, well, is it sick? Or, you know, and then the closer I got, I could see it wasn't in a natural position. Then I, when I got up to it, the entire throat and the ear was missing. A local Department of Natural Resources agent came out to investigate the incident and believes the culprit is most likely dogs or coyotes. But Wendell does not agree. Four weeks later, he saw the beast. I was out cutting alfalfa, and I was looking at nine deer uh, grazing on the edge of the field. And all of a sudden, they scattered. And I got a glimpse of something that went over the hill uh, by the deer. And I just got like two jumps of it. But it looked bigger than a coyote. Uh, it looked uh, more wolfish or possibly husky, malamute, something. The gray wolf or timber wolf is well established in Minnesota. In 2007, it was even taken off the state's endangered species list. Wildlife officials estimate there are over 3,000 timber wolves in Minnesota. The largest weigh in at over 150 pounds and as a pack are capable of taking down a one ton buffalo. While timber wolves are common in the northern forests of Minnesota, they are rarely seen in the more open western plains near Rolog. At nearly three times the size of an average coyote or dog, a timber wolf could be responsible for the attack. Wendell has called in the support of wildlife and optics expert Craig Enervold. There is something Enervold has to see. Sure. Woods and water and and there's actually no field down there, nothing's mm -hmm. packed, it, so it's pretty wild. They've been back here, there's not much left of it. So they've been here quite a bit. A deer, freshly killed. They scan the area for evidence. You clearly see it was coyote tracks. Coyote tracks could indicate the deer was killed by coyotes or just that coyotes had feasted on the dead body. Either way, the carcass is bait for whatever else may be out there. I think with all the activity you've got actually behind here, I think that on that tree there facing right over the top of the kill would be probably an ideal spot to put that camera. Okay, all right, well, we've got the batteries replacing this one here and everything seems to be working okay. The settings are right for the, what we're gonna have for our setup here. We've got a great location in here to set this one up on. We've got the, uh, the kill sites about 10 feet from the tree, which will be a, perfect location. An active feeding site should bring predators in from miles around, within range of the cameras. But even with a good photo, an animal's identity can be hard to determine. This is the case with the turn of beast photos taken by Michelle O'Donnell in Maine. One detail that's intriguing is the tasseled ears. In 1906, the Lewiston, Maine Daily Sun reported that something had been seen lurking in the fields, menacing local pickers. It was described as brown, with tasseled ears. They called it the Injun Devil. <coughs> Coincidence? Lots of canines have tasseled ears. But if there is a unique creature in Maine, these remains will prove it. These are the actual bones of the creature after it decomposed in O'Donnell's garage. What we have here are the fleshy remains of the carcass. Uh, it's got fur, flesh. Um, we're going to be sending this as well to NYU for further DNA testing. If DNA testing proves it's a unique species, it's a huge find. But it also means there would have to be more than one. While Michelle's samples of the creature are headed to NYU, 
Two other Mainers recall a terrifying run-in in 1991. It's not what they saw, but what they heard. Fell asleep, I think it was around 11. I heard something and I woke up. And I thought, well, it's just the, the curtain scraping the window. So I kind of just blew it off. And then I heard something again. And it really, really scared me. It was like something evil was outside the window. I shook Leo and he woke up. The noise that we heard uh, certainly wasn't something that we've heard before, such as a deer or a moose. What I heard was the breathing, and that's what scared me more than anything. It was breathing of a creature that had run a long distance. It was snorting from being out of breath. But I tell you what, never heard anything like that ever, and I don't ever want to hear it again. While the Davids never saw the creature, they believe the sounds were not of any native animal. Stories of this nature, have, in my experience, have always been uh, got a huge reaction. And this case was no, this was, was bigger than just about anything I'd written. I know people, you know, they fear the unknown, but they're also fascinated by it. I mean, they 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 want to hear about it. They want to level their own guesses. They want to talk about it with their neighbors. This is something that might be creeping around the, the main woods and in Maine there are a lot of woods so if there's something out there they're obviously going to be interested there may be a real animal responsible for what the Davids heard that night a beast they have good reason to fear for centuries eyewitnesses in Maine have reported mutant canines one theory they are surviving dire wolves believed to have died out 10,000 years ago. But while the Turner beast resembles a dire wolf in size and proportion, its hunched shoulders, flat snout, and big eyes seem to point to a beast of an unnatural mix. You get a hybrid dog by mating two dogs. It, it is basically how that happens. It's the same as a mutt. A mutt would be a hybrid to a certain extent. Veterinarian Jay Epping says crossbreeding in many types of animals is now common. A hybrid dog is basically the, the same as a crossbreed. It, it's a mix of two breeds of dogs. All major dog breeds that we have today are all hybrid dogs or crossbreeds. But crossbreeding in the wild is a very different animal. When two species that are close enough can breed and produce a viable uh, you know, offspring, we know about you know, mules, and we know about uh, the dolphins and whales, and uh, there's a lot of creatures that are hibernizing. To some, the turnip beast looks like a chow Rottweiler wolf hybrid. This unique mix could explain the appearance of the beast and its unusual behavior. There's no way to define what you end up with when you mix a wolf and a dog. You may end up, it may, it may be said that you end up with a, a wolf that's less fearful of humans, but what you end up having is an animal about which we know nothing. Wolf expert and executive director of the Wildlife Science Center, Peggy Callahan has seen the results of wolf-dog mixes. We don't know their impact on deer, we don't know their impact on livestock, although we can make some assumptions. We don't understand how they handle disease. Is it different than wolves? Is it different than dogs? There are many, many unknowns that, about these creatures. While rare, it is possible for dogs to breed in the wild with wolves. However, niche breeders do mix dogs with wolves in captivity. An animal could have been released intentionally or accidentally into the wild. What if one survives and breeds back with wolves? What is that creature going to be called? And, and what are we going to expect physically and behaviorally from that creature? Depending on what type of dog is mixed with the wolf, the offspring's color, size, and general appearance can vary greatly. The DNA samples at NYU will hopefully reveal the genetic background of the Turner Beast. But can it explain the other sightings in Maine or in Minnesota? There may be a more natural explanation for some accounts. Some experts believe the creature may be part of the weasel family. 
The fisher can grow to four feet long, but is very light in stature, and has been known to make a sound that sounds like a baby screaming. Similar to the sound Leo and Martha David heard in 1991. And then, there's the wolverine. An even more likely candidate from the weasel family. The wolverine is shorter but much heavier than the fisher, resembling a small bear with a long tail. They are also said to be fearless, known to take down prey as large as a moose and fight over scraps with black bears. Both animals are found in Maine and Minnesota and would likely defend themselves when confronted by a dog. Could one creature be responsible for the David's sighting in Litchfield? O'Donnell's in Turner and another account just miles away in Wales, Maine. Well, when he first turned, it looked like a friggin' werewolf. That, honest to God, it had the gray hair, the long ears, the, the fangs, and, thing, and it had like a, a long, snotty nose. It, uh, the first thing that came to mind was a werewolf movie. This time, the victim was a strong 50-pound Doberman named the Duchess. <laughs> I got Duchess when she was a little pup. She was about two months old. And I got her from the neighbor down the road here. She was really part of the family. You know, I could leave the doors unlocked. I didn't have to worry about nothing. First time I started hearing things outside was late in the evening. And I heard the dog barking and like whining. And I get dressed, I came outside, put the lights on and everything, and everything looked normal. Looked up and down the driveway, I didn't see nothing. So I went back in, and we went back to bed. Early in the morning, we heard another commotion. This was close to around 6 o'clock in the morning, I believe, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. I went outside, and I saw the dog in the doghouse, just looking at me. And I saw the dog again, just laying there, and she was all covered with blood and all that, and I went to look at the doghouse and I see that she was in a fight or something. But she was all caught up. She was having a real hard time breathing. I entitled her, we bring her in the house, and I called the vet. I explained what, what happened, and he said that uh, he couldn't do anything for her. He said the best thing to do was put her out of the misery. Just a few nights later, and still grieving, Michaud saw the killer at his doorstep, likely returning to finish what it had started. It was well into two to three o'clock in the morning. I was coming home after being with friends. I drove my driveway and I noticed something on the steps up by a front door. It looked like a wolf, but it wasn't a wolf or anything. It was none like I ever seen. He had like a paw on the step and like sniffing underneath the door like to see what was inside. And uh, then when I got a little closer, he turned and looked at me. And uh, he just stood there for a few seconds and like growled at me. Then he walked real slow around my, my car door. And then he went towards the brush pile. That's when I noticed they had a, a den there because I never noticed it before. It looked just like a wolverine, until, but the head was different. That's why I was explaining to these other people what it was. They kept saying it was a fisher or something like that, a bobcat. I said, that ain't it. I've been hunting all my life in these woods, and I know what the difference is. That night, I, I pretty well fought in the, the den. I was so mad, I drove my car over to put my tractor over it, trying to get it out, and who was in there. And I had no, no luck doing it, because I didn't want that around my kids. And to be so close to the house is... It's unbearable. Well, we set the trap out back in the field and baited it, and hopefully we can bring in some wildlife for over the next couple, three days. We'll check it every 24 hours and uh, see what happens. Is it a weasel, wolf-dog hybrid, or different animals involved in coincidental attacks? Well, people want to know what's out there roaming in their backyards. I don't think anybody's going to be satisfied with the answers that we have so far. It's on. We should be good. Let's go set the bait. 
People have looked hard at the uh, photographs of the uh, animal found out in Turner, and they, they said clearly, this is not the animal that attacked my dog, or this is not the animal I saw at the side of the road. This doesn't solve the mystery. They still want answers. Another Monster Quest search is underway in Minnesota, where Craig Enervold is setting his traps. Camera traps are the, the trail cameras that we've got set up now. Uh, we just set up in areas of high game activity. And like we've got here with the trails that kind of run through and the activity around the, the specific kill site is, um, is an easy indicator that we're going to get some activity on the cameras. Uh, again, whether it be the trail or, or the site, that just the, the putting the food source on there is enough in itself to attract animals from a great distance. After I close the box, it'll just do a countdown and she'll be ready to take pictures. So we'll just tighten that there. Take pictures and it's walking. Enervold also places another stealth cam digital game view camera near a dead horse that Wendell Olson recently lost to illness. Anytime they run across the scent of something dead in the woods, they typically investigate it and if it's something fresh that, that they can uh, make a meal out of it or, or stage it and feed off it for a while, they'll take full advantage of that. And uh, that's why a location like this here with this type of a, of a kill, it's, it's absolute great opportunity and a great food source for animals for, for quite a while. And it does not take long before the camera trap begins snapping pictures of something. In the past 20 years, there have been a handful of sightings of mysterious beasts lurking in the Maine woods. While some people like Leo and Martha David only heard the creature, others like Leo Doyon had a closer encounter. His was in 2004. I come out here, I had a cup of coffee and a cigarette, and you know, just looking around, and this creature comes out. And the color, the color was uh, blackish, with a lot of rust in it, the yellowish light. Uh, and then the worst thing that got me going is that, that the shape of this sucker. It wasn't like a, a dog standing up straight, it was more of a tilt. And it looked right at me. And the eyes, the eyes were reddish like, you know, looked like they was piercing right through you. Then he took off. He just slowly walked off and like nobody's business, you know. If I didn't know any better, I'd say it's hyena. It was built just like a hyena. The hyena angle is worth investigating. In August 2006, this photo was captured by Jacob Patton of Hovland, Minnesota along the north shore of Lake Superior. To many, this animal looks like a cross between a hyena and wolf, but there is a problem with this particular hybrid theory. Well, hyenas, for instance, are not related to dogs. You know, they're really a separate species, so the interbreeding with dogs, with uh, domestic dogs, with wolves, with uh, coyotes, would not happen. This photo is actually a coyote infected with mange a common ailment found in Maine and Minnesota in many different wild animals. When you experience an animal that's, that's been infected with mange, uh, you know, the, the, the sight can, uh, of, of an animal like that without hair on it can be something that, that's like, totally different than you've ever seen in an animal before. It's a type of mite that, that lives on the skin and feeds on, feeds on proteins on the skin. And if left untreated, can eventually lead to hair loss. And the hair loss is really what compromises wild animals. Uh, they could have a tail that's nothing but a bone spike and uh, you know, the you know, patchy hairs, bald spots you know, throughout the body. Um, it's really a horrendous look when you see an animal like that because it doesn't, without hair, it just, they, they, they look totally different than, than what they're supposed to represent. Not only does it affect the appearance of the animal, but their weakened state may drive them to seek an easy meal like a house pet. The motion-activated cameras have been snapping pictures for the last 72 hours. 
The areas that we picked were secluded areas, a lot of wildlife. Um, the wildlife's comfortable there, not a lot of foot traffic, not a lot of people, and we felt we'd get the most activity there. Four cameras and dozens of pictures later, the images baffle the experts. In this shot, something is missing. When you compared the photo before and the photo after, you clearly see bait in this image. And in the next, the bait is gone. Something had to take it, but what? A camera glitch or a stealthy animal prevented the camera from taking photos. For the team in Maine, it's clear something is there. But for now, it's a dead end. La Flamme says the search isn't over. I would absolutely love to see a, a photograph or a series of photographs of something, of something that hasn't been tampered with, that's, that's clear, clear enough for people to look at and, and make the judgment, okay, this is something unusual, this is something we haven't seen before. Um, we can't explain these photographs. You know, let's put a little more effort into this and try to see what's going on out there. Back in Minnesota, Craig Enervold is hoping to solve the mystery, too. But first, he wants to make one last effort to lure the beast closer. We've got our trail cameras put out, and uh, we're going to set up for a call sequence now. Blasting rabid distress calls is like blood in the water for a shark, bringing in predators from miles away. Got some area off to the to the, uh, to the north here that's got some real open country, some wooded area, which is very typical, good area for coyotes. They're, they're normally coming on the first call sequence, and uh, so we'll let, let the call rest. We'll shut it down for a bit, and then kind of watch and wait and see if something comes up over the top of the hill. The distress calls have no immediate results. However, they may lure a predator closer and within range of the cameras. We've got the uh, kill sites, we've got uh, the cameras set up, and we've got time. Uh, we'll let them sit for a few days. We'll come back and check the activity and, and kind of get an idea of what we have in the area here. The cameras have been out for seven days, and Enervold is anxious to see if the camera traps have produced any results. Okay, we've picked up all of our trail cameras that we've had set up for over a week and we're going to walk back to the vehicle with them and download them into the computer and see what kind of activity we've had on them. Okay, we've got, uh, we've got some images downloaded off that first camera here. It looks like we've got about uh, oh, 15, 18 different images here. Uh, as I scroll through, let's see that first night we've got some deer activity on it. Uh, snow's falling. That's some really good close-ups of deer here. Look really inquisitive. They're kind of spending a lot of time around the site of the camera here. A couple images of deer kind of looking back towards the farm. Must be some activity going back there. There's they're a little suspect of. Another camera was set up, overlooking the carcass of a horse on Wendell Olson's farm. There's some snow coming down here. Uh, a lot of snow getting on the horse carcass. Almost to the point where you can't hardly see it anymore. And here we got an image of something that came in to investigate. Got the ears turned out and just see kind of a, almost an overexposure, but it's got a long nose. Can't really make it out, but just because of the length of the nose, it sure looks like it could be a white-tailed deer that got in between the horse carcass and the camera. The horse carcass attracts more than wildlife. In a strange but very human act, one of Wendell's other horses comes to check out the remains, almost like a final tribute to his fallen friend. And as Craig continues to examine the photos, he makes an interesting discovery. Okay, there's a, there's a couple images here that I'm looking at that that uh, that certainly show there's something on the kill site. I, I, I see something. The, the horse carcass is covered up with snow, but there's there's some kind of an image on the back side of the horse. You can just see the top of its back. It's a dark image. If a mysterious hybrid creature is really living undetected in the woods of New England and Minnesota, 
It is a mangy animal with wild eyes, a terrifying howl, and a need to mangle or kill dogs. This man said he saw the creature walk across his yard. This woman and her husband said it had a howl like a crying baby. This Maine resident believes it attacked his Doberman Pinscher. This farmer lost both a dog and a horse. And this woman collected the best evidence yet when she found a dead mutant looking canine and snapped a picture that circled the internet in hours. This whole experience changed my life. Michelle O'Donnell believes this creature is not just a normal dog. When I saw that animal face to face and we locked eyes, it's, it's just something I'm never going to forget. It's gonna stay with me for the rest of my life. She kept the carcass. Something about it sparked a lot of internet debate. It seemed to have one more claw than a regular dog. Uh, I, I think a lot of people are getting very confused by this fifth claw. Uh, most dogs show four claws in their prints, and then behind the regular paw is a fifth claw, which is called the dew claw. Based on grooming and nail issues and things like that, we've learned to remove those or for hunting dogs. Those are often a source of, of problems. If they're tramping through the brush, they can tear those. Some owners want them, to, you know, want them removed, basically, so they don't have to trim the nail for ease. There's been media reports that it was a strange animal because it had five claws. and It wasn't necessarily strange. It was just a, a dog that hadn't been uh, taken care of and hadn't been domesticated, really. Although O'Donnell has remained steadfast in her belief that the creature is not a normal dog, what do the experts say? Dr. Jay Epping is a veterinarian with more than 10 years experience working with dogs. He's examined the photo closely. And it basically looks to me like it's a dog that's been in the wild for probably, you know, three or four years. Looks like the ears are kind of, you know, stunted, which could have been maybe from a little frostbite, something like that. I mean, it looks kind of mangy. He had these, you know, hair loss patches, whether or not that was from decay or not. You know, from the from the body being out in the wild for who knows how long. Well, I believe the Turner Beast, based on my examination of a photograph, would would have to be a dog. It's photographs. Wolf that. expert Peggy Callahan also has her opinion on what is in the photos. This could easily be a dog. It certainly is not a wolf. It could be a mix of the two. This picture shows uh, a canid, this is clearly a, a, a canid, but he's got a very short nose. Uh, that's not a wolf characteristic at all. He's been dead a while, uh, his eye is bulging, he's, he's quite swollen um, um, from post-mortem changes, so it makes it a little bit difficult to, to diagnose uh, much other than the fact that he's not a pure wolf. If this is just a domestic dog with mange, then becoming feral may explain the strange appearance. Domesticated dogs are not built for living in the wild. The sub-zero temperatures and battles with other wild animals can cause them to lose ears, tails, teeth, and fur. As they try to cope with an environment they were not bred to live in. Feral dogs, from what research shows us, uh, is a stray. They're domestic dogs that, that don't survive without a human-based food source. Feral dogs may be looking for dog food when they encounter the owner of the food, your pet. A wolf or a coyote or a fox or etc. are hunting on their own, but stray dogs, there's no evidence that they're actually surviving by hunting. They are surviving because they found a garbage dump, they found our, a food source from humans, they're stealing, uh, but they're not, they're not surviving. Hunger can be a strong motivator, but these are just theories for the turn of beast. DNA evidence may provide proof. Michelle held on to the carcass and sent a tissue sample to be DNA tested at New York University by Todd Disotel. I have taken a tissue sample supplied to me from a creature in Maine, extracted the DNA, sequenced it, and from the analysis of that DNA sequence, I can conclude it was a domestic dog. However, his conclusion does not rule out the possibility 
of a wolf mix. The, the father of the um, individual that we sequenced could indeed be a wolf. Um, unlikely a coyote, but it could indeed be a wolf. Domestic dogs and wolves are extraordinarily close genetically, and in fact, domestic dogs seem to have been derived several times from different sort of subspecies of wolves. If the creature was a hybrid, which is sort of more likely than being an unknown mutant, um, the mother clearly was a domestic dog and the father potentially could be a wolf. Uh, much more extensive testing, DNA testing of say the Y chromosome and other markers would have to be done. The sample was uh, pretty degraded, so I'm not sure if we would be able to get it out of that. Despite the analysis of the Turner Beast photos and DNA results, many locals are convinced there is something still out there. Possibly more dog killers. I've never seen anything like it. No, never. Uh, I know what a wolf looks like. I know what a hybrid dog looks like. And I know what a, what a fisher looks like. I'll tell you again, this was none of, none of the above. There's a couple images here that I'm looking at that that certainly show there's something on the kill site. Back in Minnesota, the mystery animal Craig Enervold captured on the camera trap finally makes itself known. Boy, it's a neat image here. I've got a bald eagle standing literally right outside the, the horse carcass. That's really a rare shot. While both expeditions produce numerous pictures, there are none that match the images taken by Michelle O'Donnell and none that provide any answers to what may have killed people's dogs. There remains to be a mystery here in Minnesota, obviously by uh, the fact that trail cameras didn't produce anything and, and again, we're very hopeful that it would, but uh, certainly things remain inconclusive. Back in Maine, Mark Laflamme accepts the DNA results for the Turner Beast, but he isn't saying all the other sightings are dogs too. Something unknown is, is, is walking through the woods at, in, in Maine and only appears now and then, and it's very elusive and very mysterious, and people still want to know what it is. Well, I know the creature's still out there. We've still seen that. And they claim they, they got one in the paper, but it didn't look nothing like what attacked my dog. And history shows that this thing has, uh, is sighted over and over again. I have a feeling uh, the future will bear that out. I have a feeling I'll be reporting on this mystery Maine creature again. I mean, I think that we really have to expand our mind to really try to look at, in a skeptical and critical way, all the possibilities before we fully accept that this is a new species or a new animal. For Wendell Olson, the farmer who lost his dog and one of his colts, the loss is still hard to deal with. You know, I kind of feel that I failed on my promise to Palmer to take care of his dog when he had to die that way. Time passes, and the seasons change for those individuals who lost their beloved dog. One of the hardest things I had to do, you know, the family pet for years, just shot her, uh, put her out of her misery. I still miss the dog a lot. Whether it's a wild dog or something else in Maine and Minnesota, there is something out there killing man's best friend.
called the chupacabra, and wherever it's reported, it leaves its mark. They're actually taking chickens and livestock and actually sucking the blood out of them. From Puerto Rico to the U.S. mainland, the mystery deepens. The animal was probably not a dog, probably not a coyote. Now what? Strange photos of an animal that stalks the night. I don't believe I've ever seen a skin condition this severe. And in one case, invades a home. An expedition in an area hot with activity. You got something? I got a reflection right there on the ground. Yeah, we got some movement here. A battery of tests looking for answers. And one of the strangest chupacabra finds of all. This is extremely unusual. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. Southern Texas, home to a host of predators like bobcats, snakes, and coyotes. Livestock deaths here are nothing new. In 2004, ranchers noticed a rash of mysterious animal killings. While most predators eat their prey, these attacks were different. There was no blood coming out of them in any place. Just, it was just, it was just bizarre. They'd wake up some one morning and find the carcass of their four favorite rabbits sucked dry of blood and just lying there on the ground. This could be a sign of a new and deadly creature, the chupacabra, said to suck the blood of farm animals. I mean, because of the big teeth on it, it looked dangerous. Front legs all looked like a kangaroo. It had fangs that were just unbelievably strange for a canine creature. Witnesses describe a bizarre four-legged hairless creature with back legs much longer than the front legs, making the beast appear to look like a cross between a canine and a kangaroo with razor-sharp fangs. Quero, Texas. In 2007, Phyllis Canyon noticed a fearsome beast skulking around her ranch. The first time I saw this animal, it was right here. And I was totally shocked because I had never seen anything that looked like this animal looked. I got out of the car and stood there and looked at it and it trotted off a little further and then it just continued to go in that direction. At the same time, Phyllis noticed that something was killing her chickens and leaving the bodies. Now, most of the predators here will actually take the animal and take it away. So I was perplexed at what this animal was that would just kill it and leave the meat. There was no blood at all. The blood was sucked out of it. I contacted my brother Byron and he said, it sounds to me like you have a chupacabra. Phyllis Canyon isn't the only Texan to see a chupacabra. Major sightings have been reported in Elmendorf and Pollock, Texas, hundreds of miles away from Cuero. These are small creatures with odd-looking teeth, fangs that are coming out. They've got hairless nature. There, there's, there's this lack of uh, hair on their bodies and a bluish kind of skin tone. Joe Conger, a reporter for San Antonio TV station KENS, covered the story. They're actually taking chickens and livestock and actually sucking the blood out of them, which is what kind of got ranchers and, and folks like that thinking, what is going on in my neighborhood? You know, what are these be beasts that are roaming through the woods? The most recent Chupacabra reports are from Texas. But the first attacks were recorded in Puerto Rico in the mid-1990s. Since then, there have been hundreds of incidents. The term Chupacabra was coined in Puerto Rico. Literally means goat sucker. According to the first reports, goats were the first animals that were killed, and those animals were drained out of blood. Wildlife expert Gustavo Rodriguez personally investigated some of the reported Chupacabra attacks. The peak of a Chupacabra story came back in 1995, where the local tabloid newspapers in Puerto Rico were reporting hundreds of these attacks uh, during a course of several months. People did not know what was going on. 
the government put civil defense officials in charge of investigating the attacks. I work in emergency management until 16 years, and we never saw that kind of, uh, of scene in, in my life. Photos taken during the crisis clearly show farm animals with distinctive puncture wounds. Emergency management supervisor Ami Vasquez saw the dead animals up close. In, in the majority of the cases that we investigate of the chupacabra, the animals was uh, without blood. But the creature described to Vasquez was different than the creatures in the Texas sightings. Witnesses in Puerto Rico describe the chupacabra as a two-legged hairless beast that stands on its hind legs like a kangaroo with sharp fangs and huge glowing red eyes. It resembles a gargoyle. El chupacabra del alto mío tiene los ojos ovalados, rojo y tiene los cuatro colmillos muy largos. Eyewitness Misael Negron Melendez saw the creature firsthand. It's an experience he won't soon forget. It was a fall night in 1995. Negron was on his balcony when he noticed something standing by the far railing. Entonces yo me quedaba mirando todo el tiempo, mirándolo y mirándolo. Pero empecé a caminar hacia donde él. Misael got closer and realized that the creature on the edge of the balcony was unlike anything he had ever seen. Entré a la casa y cerré la puerta inmediatamente. But the creature wasn't done with him. Soon, chupacabra reports were pouring in from Chile, Nicaragua, Mexico, and the United States. The most recent sightings in the U.S. have been centered in Texas, including one in the town of Elmendorf. Okay, breeding pens. Rancher Devin McNally knows firsthand how deadly these animals can be. He says that in 2005, a chupacabra began stalking and killing his chickens. Here, I, I, I found as many as over 30 in, uh, on one of the chupacabras killed. But they were just dead. And like the Puerto Rican attacks, McNally was shocked to find the animals drained of blood. There was no blood coming out of them in any place. Just, it was just, it was just bizarre. The gruesome death of his chickens coincided with the appearance of a strange creature. I saw this creature four times. I, every time I ran inside to get the gun, time I got back, she was gone. I'm wasting my time. So I, I decided the next time I saw the animal, I would put a gun handy so that I wouldn't have to go inside and get it. A few days later, Devin got his chance. Well, I was carrying buckets of water. My mind totally was oblivious to anything else, but then I saw the animal. It was within 30 yards of me. I had the gun propped up in the tree branch in the crook. So all I had to do was take it and just find my range. And I, I knew that I would need to act that fast. Devin killed the creature with one shot. I just popped off one shot as fast as I could. When Devin approached the kill, he was amazed by what he saw. Photos taken at the time show a four-legged animal with big teeth and bizarre skin. After I shot it and I was approaching it carefully with gun ready, it got weirder and weirder. It looked as though, what's wrong with the skin? What's, what's, what's that weird color? The skin was like an elephant's, that the animal was probably not a dog, probably not a coyote. Now what? Devin still has the bones of the creature he killed. Cryptozoologist Ken Gerhard has followed the Chupacabra reports for years. 
He and wildlife expert Lee Hales are about to launch an expedition here in South Texas. Well, this is our target area, Lee. Their goal? To capture a live chupacabra. The evidence they uncover, plus key existing evidence like hair, teeth, and skin of these beasts, will be sent to several labs across the U.S. Experts will look for clues to just what this beast is. But Gerhard first heads to Devin McNally's ranch to get an up-close look at the bones of the creature he hopes to capture. He's been studying the animals of Texas for years, and right away he notices a startling feature, the fangs. This is obviously uh, the canine tooth on this, uh, on this animal. However, uh, we can see that it seems a lot, lot more pronounced than typically we would see on, on, a, on an animal of this size. These large canine teeth are one indication that this could be a creature unknown to science. But further analysis is needed. We have some good molars here left on this lower jaw, and particularly the molars are, are good for DNA testing because they have, you know, they are the first teeth that are developed. This molar will be sent to a lab at New York University for a complete DNA analysis. Ken lays out the creature's bones to get a better idea of the body shape. Just a very loose reconstruction here just to kind of get some of the scale of the animal and see if we can see any other anomalies in some of the bones here. One anomaly is immediately apparent, the skull itself. And this is the sagittal crest. This appears to be a little bit more pronounced than what we typically see here. It's very high, it's kind of pointy. This could be an important clue to the creature's origins. Ken takes some measurements and photos of the crest for comparison to known mammals. But Ken has a preliminary assessment of the bones. Very obviously a carnivore. And more specifically, it looks very much like a canine. A canine, even a jagged toothed monster like this one, is still a four-legged creature. But the chupacabra in Puerto Rico was always described as standing on two legs. How can the descriptions of the chupacabra vary so wildly? Basically, the, the, uh, the legend of the chupacabra spread around the globe uh, in a variety of ways. One is through the media. Author Benjamin Radford studies the role of the media in sightings like these. There were news reports of these chupacabra attacks, chupacabra sightings uh, on TV and the newspaper. That's, that really disseminated it. While the creature descriptions varied, the result of the attacks were the same. The hallmark of chupacabras is not its physical description because people don't agree on what it looks like. Its hallmark is the dead animals it leaves behind. And that still leaves just who or what is responsible for the killings. But Phyllis Canyon thinks that she may have the answer to the Texas attacks. This is the beast that we think is the chupacabra. The first eyewitness accounts of the chupacabra came in Puerto Rico in the mid-1990s. Researcher Mark Davenport and filmmaker Joe Palermo were in Puerto Rico filming a documentary during the height of the attacks. Day and night, over the radio, over television, in the newspaper, whatever, they were constantly talking about this chupacabra activity going on. This was very serious to them. The animal deaths were a continuing thing. This happened almost daily. They wake up some one morning and find the carcass of their four favorite rabbits sucked dry of blood and just lying there on the ground. Palermo and Davenport turn their cameras to the Chupacabra story. Their footage is now important existing evidence of the first attacks. They conducted dozens of interviews. But this interview with a local mayor was interrupted by an urgent phone call. A chupacabra had just been spotted nearby. Davenport and Palermo rushed to the scene. The description that we've been getting of chupacabras, they tend to have claws. The location was in the hills above Canovanas, Puerto Rico. Coming to this particular neighborhood almost every night for four months. 
Incredible. Eso, eso toda la noche. Every night, every day. Every toda night. La noche. Last night too. La, o sea, la, 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 last la, night. Claro. In Canovanus, Palermo and Davenport met villagers who thought they had found a chupacabra nest. Maybe she take us now to show us the nest and tell her we will protect her. It's barbed wire, so I'm going to try to see if I can find some hair samples on the barbed wire. Picked up right here. I found the hairs both in that in that nest-looking place and in that trail that kind of led up to it. What we've done here is uh, we've taken some hair samples from the edge of the wall. We have uh, testimony that the chupacabras jumped this wall into this area and killed a rabbit. Mark Davenport found hair samples from the alleged chupacabra nest. They do seem to be curly. Could they be hair from a chupacabra? Mm. This existing evidence will be sent for two tests. DNA testing and forensic analysis. The first ever on this hair. Hair is not like a fingerprint. Uh, it does not give individual characteristics. It's called a class characteristic. And what that means is that we can by and large identify the species that uh, a hair comes from. That analysis will be conducted by Irving Cornfield a specialist in forensic hair analysis, something he usually does for law enforcement in poaching investigations. The hair will be cross-checked against animals native to Puerto Rico to ensure that it did not come from a known animal. The list is relatively short. We don't have any native large mammals in Puerto Rico. All of the large mammals are basically exotics or feral species like uh, the mongoose and uh, several types of species of monkeys. Puerto Rico is home to a large population of rhesus monkeys. These monkeys are not native to Puerto Rico. They were brought here for research purposes in the 1930s. But several dozen managed to escape. Could one of these escaped primates be responsible for the animal killings? Our forensic hair tests on the Puerto Rican hair samples could help prove whether or not the chupacabra was a primate. In Texas, the skeletal evidence is still being analyzed. Phyllis Canyon believes the chupacabra is some type of new aggressive canine and she says she has the evidence to prove it in 2007 Phyllis's neighbors reported a strange roadkill on the highway Canyon retrieved the carcass thinking it could be the mystery creature that was killing her chickens she froze the head to preserve the biological evidence which should help cryptozoologist Ken Gerhard's investigation. Phyllis, I'm really not sure what to say. This is unlike anything I've ever seen. Very unusual looking animal. It's obviously a predator or a carnivore of some type, I would say, based on the teeth. Like the chupacabra skeleton from Elmendorf, Texas, these canine teeth seem unusually large. The skin also seems unnatural. I a correlate this skin to what elephant skin is like. It was very, very coarse skin, very hard to actually cut through it with a knife. Seems like the skin is completely smooth, devoid of most of the hair. We mm -hmm. see some little traces here and there. In all, three scientific tests will be conducted on the Quero creature by three different scientists. Hairs will be given to Irving Cornfield to compare to the Puerto Rican hair samples. Skin will be sent to veterinary pathologist Joanne Mansell to see if the creature has a skin disease. Finally, a tissue sample will be sent to New York University's Todd de Sotel for DNA testing. But for Gerhard, by far the best evidence would be a live chupacabra. And the Canyon Ranch is the perfect place to try to find one. Phyllis says she saw one of these creatures on her property eight weeks earlier. Lee Hales, a wildlife expert from Louisiana, spent years within the National Park Service. 
He has agreed to join Ken in the hunt on the ranch. V. How you doing? Thanks for making it out. Oh, I wouldn't miss it. Together they will attempt to do what no one has done before. Capture evidence of a living chupacabra. It isn't outside the realm of possibility that there's something a little bit different here. We have a lot of land to cover. To help in their hunt for evidence of the creature, they'll be setting motion-sensitive cameras throughout the property, baited with blood-soaked meat. And to increase the chances of catching one alive, they will use a steel cage trap. Go for it. Put a little weight on that. The hunt is on. At the Canyon Ranch in Quero, Texas, cryptozoologist Ken Gerhard and wildlife expert Lee Hales are on the hunt for evidence of a blood-sucking chupacabra. This is the location of the most recent sighting, but they have hundreds of acres to cover. This watering hole might be a good place to start. There's evidence of a lot of animals here. Could that include a chupacabra? And that's where I want to put the bait. It's right down there at the water's edge. That's kind of perfect right there. That's downward. good right there. Hales and Gerhard are putting motion detecting cameras here. But to increase the chance of getting the beast, they are going to set out raw, rancid meat, soaked in blood as bait. The water hole is a small part of the entire property, all of which is teeming with signs of animals. One theory is that the beast could actually be a normal animal with a serious disease. Most wild mammals will hide illness as long as they possibly can. Sharman Hoppus is a professor at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Texas A&M. That's the animal that's going to come in and maybe steal your cat or your dog or your chickens. One disease that affects wild animals is called mange. Mange is actually a mite. It's a little organism that gets on the skin of the animals. In Texas, it's known to affect coyotes, foxes, even domestic dogs. Mange affects a canine's appearance. And it causes severe itching, and that will lead to them scratching and licking and chewing at their skin, causing the skin to become inflamed and pigmented and thickened and severe hair loss. But not everyone agrees with the mange theory. I've killed mangy coyotes before, and uh, most of them that you killed, they, have, they either have hair somewhere on them under their belly or on the back of them uh, have hair. But this near had no hair hardly at all on him. In 2005, Ben and Tyrell O'Quinn came face to face with a mysterious canine. It happened at their home in Pollock, Texas, over 200 miles from the Canyon Ranch in Cuero. And the creature, they say, looked a lot like the one that Phyllis Canyon discovered. I come home from school one day. My dad and grandpa called me to come down here because the dogs had something bait up under the house. <laughs> Tyrell grabbed a rope and went under the house to try and pull the creature out. He was shocked by what he saw. He got real close to it, about two or three feet. And uh, he just had, you know, these real big teeth, canines. And uh, just smoky gray looking. She didn't have no hair on it. I had my 22 Magnum when he went under the house in case this creature wanted to attack him or something. I could kill him before he got to attack. Ben shot the creature dead. Tyrell pulled the dead carcass out from under the house. Photos show what they found. A hairless, canine-like creature with crusty skin and huge teeth. MonsterQuest gave this photographic evidence to Charmin Hoppers for analysis. I don't believe I've ever seen a skin condition this severe in any of the domestic animals that I've taken care of in practice. And certainly have not seen it in a wildlife case at all. If this is mange, it is one of the most severe cases I've ever seen. The skin from the creature in Pollock appears very similar to the skin from the Quero, Texas creature. Monster Quest a skin sample from the Quero creature to Joanne Mansell, a veterinary pathologist at Texas A&M. We're looking for 
um, A, to find out what species this creature comes from, um, B, to see if there's inflammation, um, C, to see whether these creatures had normal hair follicles at some time, and if possible, to tell what the creature is. Mansell used an alcohol solution on skin scrapings, which he examined under a microscope, looking for signs of the mite that causes mange. Her results could prove whether or not this creature suffers from a known disease, or whether the creature was naturally hairless, like a Zolo or Mexican hairless dog. Forensic hair specialist Irving Cornfield has completed his analysis of the hair sample from the reported chupacabra nest in Puerto Rico. Some have speculated that the hairs could have come from a rhesus monkey, an invasive species now found on the island. He first examined the hair with a conventional microscope to produce photos like these. With the internal structure and the core here, I was able to say definitively that this was not a hair from a rhesus monkey. Next, Cornfield used a high-powered electron microscope to produce photos like these. Electron microscopes can magnify an image a million times more than the human eye can see. It's very clear in this electron micrograph that you can see the sample was, was compressed and um, part of the structure was, was being lost. But the third uh, photograph that we took under the uh, electron microscope revealed a scalation pattern. These scalation patterns are used to determine species. The overall conclusion is that the morphology of those samples um, is consistent with that of a canid, probably a domestic dog. This suggests several possibilities, that this is not a hair from a chupacabra, but of a dog that somehow got into the nest. Or that the chupacabra is itself a canine, perhaps sick, or of a bizarre type not yet documented, as the sightings in Texas suggest. The next step will be to compare these hairs with the hairs taken from Phyllis Canyon's Texas chupacabra, to see if there is a link. At the Canyon Ranch, Gerhard and Hales have been baiting their traps with meat. Uh, it will stay here, and it won't move on. Over but they also have another kind of bait. I brought some coyote urine. Uh, could be an attractant, but this is generally used uh, for hunting varmints, predators, specifically coyotes. Essentially, we're going to act like dogs, and using that, start to spread it around this area. Canines rely on scent when hunting. So the coyote urine will attract any canine predators in the area. The second camera trap goes here, facing the fence. Surrounding the wide open fields are acres of dense woods, which could be the perfect hiding place for the chupacabra. I am seeing a big intersection here. Here's a game trail, here's a game trail, there's a game trail. More stable. The third camera trap goes here, in the midst of all this animal traffic. These game trails lead to the area where Phyllis Canyon keeps her chickens. Well, this is our target area, Lee. This is the chicken coop uh, where Phyllis has been keeping her chickens, and the exact location where evidently the, uh, the animal was taking chickens. Okay. So Phyllis normally uses this cage as a chicken coop. But it has a secondary usage as well. Well, as you can see, it is a trap with a steel door. Right. And a mechanism here that can be activated when anything steps on that plate. Okay. What I'm thinking is let's bait this trap and keep it in this exact location. Gerhard and Hale set the trap in the hope they might catch the mystery predator alive. Yeah, that's true too. They use one of Phyllis's remaining chickens as live bait to increase their chances. So we know for sure this thing is attracted to chickens, whether it be the sound, scents, and all that stuff. So I think this is a good idea to put this one here as well as our dead chicken bait. This way we're utilizing all of our faculties, scents, smell. The final camera trap is set up here, overlooking the steel cage. The traps are set, and now night is approaching when most animals come out to hunt. Will a chupacabra be one of them? 
Will a chupacabra be one of them? You got something? I got a reflection back on the ground. I thought I saw it too. Yeah. Ken Gerhard and Lee Hales are on the hunt in southern Texas for a mystery predator. Some are calling a chupacabra. Hair from the creature found here on the Canyon Ranch has now been analyzed by forensic hair investigator Irving Cornfield. And it is providing more clues to the creature's identity. This hair sample is from the alleged um, Texas chupacabra and it's exceptionally crisp. It's consistent with that of a, uh, of a canid, uh, and it's also very, very similar to the pattern that we saw in hares in Puerto Rico. It's consistent with that of a dog. A DNA analysis of the hares could be more definitive. Such a test is underway at New York University, conducted by Todd DeSotel. So far, the evidence from Puerto Rico and Texas seem to point towards a canine, perhaps a known species mutated in some way, or altogether new. And canines exhibit very particular hunting behavior. If the chupacabra is a canine predator, it's most likely gonna be seen early morning or kind of late evening. It's gonna be when it's most actively hunting. Gerhard and Hales will ramp up their search as the sun sets. Well, it looks like we got about uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes left of daylight. Uh, of course, dusk is coming, and that's yeah. when we can really expect the biggest action, right? Most predators tend to move around. Most animals tend to move around right after the sun falls. Mm -hmm. So this is really our best opportunity in the next couple hours to see something, and who knows? They brought along some technology to maximize their chances of finding the suspected chupacabra. This is the Fox Pro Scorpion. It's an extremely advanced game calling system. We have a remote control unit with hundreds of different animal calls at our disposal in the database. And via remote control, we'll be able to activate the speaker system and place it wherever we want. The Fox Pro Scorpion has a range of up to 500 meters. This is a great spot, I think, to hang this little speaker. Because we got the remote control. And can... Gerhard and Hales will use distressed rabbit calls to try and attract their prey. Back at Texas A&M, Charmin Hoppus is examining the measurements taken by Ken Gerhard of the creature from Elmendorf, Texas. Gerhard felt the teeth were larger than what is found in a typical canine skull. The canine tooth here does look a little bit more pronounced. The length of the tooth in this, um, in the Elmendorf beast, would be a little bit basically right in between the domestic dog and the coyote. The Elmendorf canine tooth is too small to be from a dog and too large to be from a coyote. The sagittal crest, the ridge of bone running down the center of the skull is yielding more clues. The um, sagittal crest does appear to be somewhat larger than you would expect in most species of canines. The photographic evidence of all three chupacabras from Elmendorf, Cuero, and Pollock, Texas do yield one definite result. I would say that these are probably very similar species and um, certainly a small coyote, fox, or some type of hybrid between the coyote and the domestic dog or a wild dog. These three bizarre creatures found in three different locations across Texas all share similar origins. Mm. Back in Cuero, night has fallen, and the hunt has begun. Gerhard and Hales are set up near the steel cage trap. They hope that the live chicken will attract some hungry predators, and maybe even their chupacabra. Let's see what we get. Let's try some uh, coyote howls. The game caller is placed 200 yards from this hiding spot. Hales and Gerhard use night vision technology to see if anything comes out of hiding. Where I'm seeing a little bit down there past that pole. I don't know how much better your unit is. I can see all the way to the telephone pole. Yeah, I can see a little bit past that. Uh, just kind of waiting to see if anything moves or comes out or reacts to our uh, call blast in here. And right away, they do find something. Gerhard and Hales move in for a closer look. Here's something. Do you hear that? 
right above, and there's where they're crunching. See these reflecting? You see that? You got something? I got a reflection right there on the ground. I Look. thought I saw it too. Yeah. But this creature is a familiar one, a rabbit. It's a rabbit. It's not a chupacabra, but it could be a meal for one. After 15 minutes of call blasting, it's time to move to the next area. All right, good luck, chicken. All right. We'll be back. As they approach the watering hole, Gerhard and Hales notice something in the shadows. There's something out there. I just saw something move, I'm pretty sure, right here at the front end of this steeple. Uh, I'm not sure what I saw, but uh, just a minute ago when we were starting to walk up on the pond, I saw very clear and definite motion of something moving and kind of ducking down right here at the edge. You're a dark the... figure very low to the ground kind of scraping along the front here. Okay. He was coming over here to investigate the noise, most likely. Whatever was out there seems to have gone back into hiding for now. So I would say the best plan at this point is to hunker down, yeah. let our camera traps and our hopefully our steel cage trap do their job. Right, we got a little bit of a storm possibly rolling in after midnight. So yeah, we might as well just take cover and uh, let all these traps do their work. Will the morning reveal new answers or new mysteries? The door's down. Yeah, we got something, something in there. Reports of the Chupacabra, a strange blood-sucking beast first appeared in Puerto Rico in 1995. This man says it was as tall as he was, with red eyes and four fangs. This woman says she found one on her Texas ranch, where it killed dozens of her chickens. But the Texas creature seen here on the right looked different. More like a canine than the strange being on the left seen in Puerto Rico. It's possible it could be related to a dog or even possibly a hybrid of a coyote and a dog. Investigators tested biological evidence from the remains of two dead creatures. Eyewitnesses support the possibility of the chupacabra. But can science prove it? No. Cuero, Texas. The morning following the night expedition, Ken Gerhard and Lee Hales are off to check their traps for evidence of the mystery beast. There's our cut. Their first stop is the steel cage. The door's down. Yeah? You got something, something in there. Mm -hmm. What is that? That is a... That's a possum. It's, a possum. it's not what they were looking for. It's time to release this animal back into the wild. Well... Next, Gerhard and Hales begin checking the camera traps for evidence of other animals. Too, but not very many. Bait's gone. Bait's gone completely? Yeah. The last camera was set up by the spot where they spread coyote urine. All right. Aha. Uh -huh. Something took our bait. Yeah. Wow. It's completely gone, huh? They discover strange markings on the post where they sprayed the coyote urine. Something, Something scratched the post. Raked it with its claws right here where we blasted that coyote urine. Right. About three feet. That's a pretty good height there. Yeah. You know, based on the animals we've seen around the property so far, that's substantial. I would, I, this is significant. Yeah. The scratches were made by something big. This is roughly the same location where Gerhard saw the creature in the shadows the night before. What type of animal could have done this? I mean, it's not a canine, it, right? It, this isn't a typical marker. This isn't something that that a normal animal would walk around marking the trees such as this. Gerhard and Hales return to their truck to download the photo evidence. The camera near the cage captured dozens of photos of the possum. All right, well, evidently this is the first shot we have of our... Uh of the possum entering our, our trap. Mm -hmm. And if we scroll through here quickly, we can see how many times we captured the animal uh, yeah. moving around. The camera from the woods is also promising. Gerhard and Hales find another possum and a surprise. Whoa, what do we have here? 
That is an armadillo. But the camera evidence from the fence post is disappointing. Uh, well, unfortunately, it looks like we didn't catch our quarry here on the uh, camera that we had set up by the post that was scratched. It would indicate that maybe the camera was not working properly. Whatever was here seems to have gotten away unseen. But something was out there. Just a few weeks after Gerhard and Hales finished their expedition, Phyllis Canyon found this creature dead on her neighbor's property. And it is strikingly similar to the first creature she found. The creature has large canines and enormous claws. Is this the beast that scratched the post? It's now up to the physical evidence from the existing creatures to provide answers. Veterinary pathologist Joanne Mansell wanted to determine if the first Quero Texas beast was a regular animal with mange. But the sample was problematic. If you take it from a dead animal, the blood supply is no longer supporting the skin. It's no longer nu uh, giving nutrition to the skin. And so the, the piece of tissue is dead. And that prevented Mansell from making a determination of mange. Though it's possible the animal did have the condition. But the analysis did provide other answers. What I could say from that tissue is that A, the um, skin was from a carnivore. Um, I can tell that because carnivores have different hair follicles to either omnivores or herbivores. So it could be a canine. But her investigation ruled out the theory that it was a Zolo, a Mexican hairless dog. This was a creature that at one time had a full hair coat. Back in New York, DNA expert Todd DeSotel has finished his analysis of the evidence. He first looked at the hair from the Puerto Rico sighting and compared it to the tooth from the Elmendorf beast. That tooth came from the animal in this photograph. The Puerto Rican hair sample and the Elmendorf tooth sample had identical DNA sequences. They were 100% match for each other, and they both matched the domestic dog. But the results from Quero, Texas are a bit different. This is another picture from the specimen in Quero, which looks similar to the Elmendorf specimen. But is it? The mitochondrial DNA results, those from the female lineage, clearly indicate that the Quero sample is a coyote. The Y chromosome signature, on the other hand, is very similar to that of wolves from Mexico and Texas. Coyotes are common in South Texas. And while wolves are extinct in Texas, some have been reintroduced to neighboring states and wolves do occasionally breed with coyotes. If the specimen does not have mange, then the appearance of its skin is a mystery. But the eyewitnesses in Texas remain skeptical that what they saw was merely a dog or coyote. This creature is not only like nothing I had ever seen before in my life, but no one I ever talked to had ever seen anything like it. Well, I've seen mangy coyotes on this ranch and on other ranches, and I know what mangy coyotes look like. And witnesses in Puerto Rico believe no dog could have been responsible for the grisly animal killings. No hay forma de que haya sido un perro porque los perros no atacan como el chupacabra. A dog don't do this kind of wounds. I believe in chupacabras because I saw the wounds. I saw the animals without blood. So while the evidence points to a dog or dog hybrid, those who have seen the monster they call the Chupacabra believe it is something entirely new. And those who see monsters like this may in fact be witnessing an evolutionary jump to a new species of tomorrow. Texas, of course, is a state steeped with mystery. I'm very convinced that their possibility is here for some type of unknown animal. I've talked to too many people. I've looked at too many pictures. I've done research. I know animals. And I know that this is a very different, strange animal.
So und so.